Hi everybody. Well, Susie and I are back with you. Today we're going to be talking about the Oz factor, which is a very strange phenomenon that um, often occurs in close encounter experiences. So Susie, tell us how, where that term came from and a little bit of the history. Well, the, ter the term was coined by the British UFO researcher Jenny Randalls in her book UFO Reality, published in 1983. And uh, she, in her research, she had discovered that um, a, a lot of people describe some rather paranormal circumstances surrounding their, uh, their contact experiences or close proximity to craft. And um, so she decided to use this terminology. Of course, it's, uh, it originates from the wonderful Wizard of Oz book, storybook, where Dorothy goes into an alternate um, dimension. And so the parallel here is that we're dealing with something where people may, their consciousness or whatever, may um, go into some other kind of altered state, other dimensional reality or some paranormal status which is reflected physically, emotionally, mentally um, and is associated with, with sound and a whole lot of other characteristics that we can go on as, as we progress through our talk today. Mm. So it's like a, people are, are either put into a bubble of alternate reality I guess and which is um, a particular zone of uh, in, uh, area where um, those things happen where, where time can slow down or it can go backwards or forwards or time can be frozen. And during the 90s, I had various, many reports actually, people having close encounters where they would be what they thought was inside this uh, bubble um, and but on the where the air would be still, um, but on the outside, you know, that they could see the trees blowing, particularly if there were storms and if it was rain and they wouldn't feel any of that. And they wouldn't even hear any of it. They would, uh, but they could see it outside this um, non non physical um, zone. That's right. And I think that uh, if we go right back to the say the seventies, where we had a lot of the abduction and contact um, instances being being actually publicised for the first time or in numbers for the first time. I think there was a lot of misunderstanding around that. And um, I know at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, in um, uh, you know, paranormal research and psychical research, um, people, psychologists believed that this kind of experience was like a derealization being carried out by the person where they removed themselves either very quickly or over a period of time from what we see as our standard reality. But of course, um, there are there are many people who've experienced this kind of thing right across the board, perfectly same, normal people, whereas once this would have been associated with mental illness, of course, now in the context of alien contact, um, we're, we're viewing it very differently. And I think in the 80s, um, people, uh, Jenny Randall certainly, and probably a lot of other researchers, including Bud Hopkins, John Mack, would have found that people were reluctant to talk about this aspect of the contact. They would try to keep it clinical and credible by giving the characteristics of whatever object they saw or whatever entity they may have seen. But um, what they experienced surrounding that and the other symptoms and things that happened to them, like bodily paralysis, etc., people kept quite quiet about that. And I think researchers had to really probe a little bit and write, ask the right questions and encourage people to get them to actually bring this material out. Of course, back in the day, um, we had a lot of people, and we still have skeptics and people who say, oh, they're suffering sleep paralysis or, or other kinds of psychological um, uh, anomalies. But of course, in the light today of what we now know about uh, relativity, quantum physics, um, and other forms of physics, we now know that, uh, that this makes complete sense in the modern understanding of physics. So we're moving into another area where a lot of those experiences can be re-examined under, under a whole new banner and understanding. Well, um, in some cases too, when, um, and this I guess comes down to the investigator, is um, certainly an, a knowledge of um, the Oz factor, 
uh, and to know to probe more deeply when they're interviewing witnesses. Um, and sometimes, in some cases, I found that witnesses, actually in a lot of cases, witnesses didn't even identify those sort of um, events as related to a UFO that they were actually uh, seeing. So, so in their mind, they would separate out that information. So they wouldn't even tell you until you actually started to probe mm. more deeply with about their whole experience. And and that happens a lot too with, in cases, even just in simple things like where people will ring up and say, I saw something. And then you say, did you see something? Have you ever seen anything else? You don't know until you ask those um, you know, questions that will take them beyond that particular experience. That's right, Cheryl. And of course, um, some of the symptoms uh, experienced by people with the Oz factor, they have a huge crossover with um, post-traumatic stress or trauma or the fight and flight um, characteristics that we exhibit as human beings when we're faced with something unusual, frightening, life-threatening or, or un, uh, you know, unexpected or whatever. So there is this crossover that happens. But when you really start looking more deeply at the symptoms, um, you, you realise that, uh, that they are quite specific to the event. And certainly Jenny Randalls and some of the early researchers discovered that there was a, a zone around, seemed to be a zone around the target person or the person who was uh, experiencing the contact or the sighting as a witness. And that could include um, traffic that would normally be, be travelling in the area suddenly not coming through. That um, people who would normally be walking around or in close proximity in the area would not be there or they would not see anything. They would not recall anything. They would not even look in the direction that the person might be looking at. Um, so we have this, this zone of uh, disconnection around the person where, as you said before, they're in some kind of bubble and they, that's created through consciousness um, and maybe even through implants, we don't know yet. Um, that, that targets that person and somehow or other isolates them out from the reality and around them. Mm, and groups of people too. Um, yes. I think the question around it is, um, you know, like we, we seem to, um, well, researchers suggest, and I think it's probably true that um, some UFOs phase in and out of, of this reality that we exist in or have the ability to, to be in other dimensions in a very real sense, uh, which our own scientists are starting to understand. Um, and maybe some of that um, could explain why uh, when they come through or bleed through into this reality, that um, either um, their proximity has an effect on, on someone who happens to be there, or they, or it has a specific effect on that person, you know, for, and this is the big question, isn't it? Why do some people have these experiences and others don't, which I always hark back to, and, and is this still the, the unanswered question? So, um, but it could all, that Oz factor could also explain discrepancies in, in witnesses' um, descriptions like time, oh, uh, it took this long, no, it was this long, or something like that, or uh, witnesses might see something and someone will see something and say, did you see that? And they say to the other witness or the other person, no, I didn't. What are you talking about? You know, so, so maybe the Oz factor has far more of an impact in our, um, on recorded and documented cases, which really hasn't been uh, fully explored to the extent that it should be. Absolutely, and I think there's probably a, a number of uh, possible theories or ideas that come into play. And moving in and out of dimensions uh, may certainly be one of them. Then again, it may simply be that a, a connection is made between the consciousness of the craft, if you want to put it that way, those on the craft, the, the collective consciousness on the craft or particular entities with the target person or, or people. And um, so therefore, or it's not, it may be not so much on occasions that there's some kind of shift in and out of dimension, but it may be that there is this shift in consciousness and this direct link um, through this zone of influence around the person that is made by the occupants of the craft or whatever. Mm. And, you know, um, if we want to get into some of the, the symptoms that people experience, um, you, you know, some people recall this kind of Oz factor in a, 
in a very um, negative and frightening sense. It's been traumatic. It may be associated with extremely loud uh, noise that is so loud and invasive that it, that it causes them to lose consciousness. And certainly um, I, over the years in my own experiences, have been subjected to a variety of sound mechanisms that are designed to do certain things to the person, putting you into a light altered state, a deeper altered state, a sleepy state, um, straight out of sleep, unconscious or whatever. Um, so we have the use of sound being used uh, very often in these events. And some people, if the, if the uh, communication or event has been positive, um, they will remember it as peaceful, serene. They will recall quiet sound. They will recall maybe buzzing or humming and, uh, and positive things in association with the event. They may also feel their body drumming or vibrating or whatever, but, but in their own consciousness, they're quite okay with that. Uh, other people hear really loud noise. If it's invasive, it's frightening, it's traumatic, and the shaking or vibration of the body may be to them like a massive loss of control of their bodily function. And that in itself is traumatic when you find that you can only move your head or your eyes and no other part of your body, that you can't do anything to wake up your husband, wife, partner, or anyone else in the vicinity. And, and then um, you have this sometimes passing out uh, or, let, or the memory stops at that point and restarts later on. Mm. Uh, so there are a lot of emotional factors uh, that happen at the time of the event um, and then after the event when the person tries to assimilate it into their life and, and analyse and examine what happened to them and why they think it may have happened. And then, of course, you have some people who have no memory of what happened and you have others who have good memory or partial memory of what took place next. And they can recall coming out of that Oz factor and they're in another place like on a craft or back in their car or whatever. And, uh, and, and that can be traumatic in itself or it may be something that the person recalls having done before and feels okay about it, has some other deeper understanding of it that, that perhaps those who feel the experience is really traumatic don't have. So um, there are a lot of factors associated with the Oz factor that, as you said, need to be looked at. We need to really relook really at this in terms of um, the physics and consciousness that we are beginning to understand as, as a human race now. Mm. I'm wondering while you're speaking about, um, you know, the when someone has a, a shock experience that doesn't compute in their mind, you know, it's not logical. Suddenly we're taking out of that logical frame of reference and put into an illogical one, yep. where, where, uh, which, by the way, is, is what mm -hmm. the effects of what a, a Zen Cohen is supposed to do to prepare the student for information you know to take them to, to a different place in their understanding i you know I'm, I'm wondering i'm sort of tossing up as to whether this is like a a side effect of advanced technology on the the physical the physiology of a human being or is it um you know is it uh, created in a way that is like a um i guess you'd say like people are zapped so in a way that prepare does that and is done on purpose though and is to enable that person to be prepared for the experience which they often sometimes aren't or mentally experience you know mentally prepared to take in information because we know i know um with a lot of the hundreds of people that i've interviewed in in that particular uh, decade um that you know, they said, I've got all this information in my head, but I can't get it out. I can't put it down on paper. It's like I, I know how the universe works, but I cannot describe it. I can't articulate it whatsoever. What about you? Yes, uh, I totally agree with that. And certainly um, uh, I agree that in some respect, there's, this is a preparation. Um, the Oz factor is a preparation. Often, though, um, in the old days, at least, it was a preparation for being taken on board a craft. And simply because there are so many, at that time, there were so many 
hundreds, thousands of people worldwide being taken on craft at night for instruction and learning or whatever it is that their, their uh, sole task is in this life in association with working with these entities, shall we say. Um, yes, it's a preparedness for being transported because if you've got people in various states of conscious of, of um, wakefulness or awareness um, and they're in a fear state or they're in a highly excited state or whatever, it's difficult to move people quickly. And so it has, I have seen on craft and I have, and I understand from experiencing it myself, that it, um, in many ways it's a simple way to, to move people around very quickly. And often when you get off the, the small craft onto a larger craft at the other end, um, you come to full awareness, you know why you're there, you know what's happening, you know what's going on around you. And very often at the end of the experience, and I describe this in my book, um, that people will then go be put back sometimes into that altered state um, for once again for ease and quickness of transport and it takes you into a state where you're not necessarily going to remember what took place that night because if you had millions of people worldwide recalling exactly what they are involved in um, during these sessions uh, you, you'd have a massive um, problem on the planet to be dealt with um, so there is a, a matter of timing here and readiness so that people are, uh, are put into a lulled state. And I have memory of sitting on a seat waiting to be put onto a small craft to be transported home and, um, and being uh, hearing a sound, uh, like a, a humming sound, which was very lulling. The atmosphere was quite warm and, and you started to feel sleepy. And then it was easy just to be directed to do this, do that, get on this craft, whatever, you go back to bed, you're in a sleepy state, you don't remember what's taken place and you fall, fall asleep. So there's, there's that reason, um, but also uh, some people are just not meant to remember what is taking place. And uh, you did mention another point, but it slipped my mind at the moment, so carry on. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, well, I was just going to go into cases because we've only got, um, trying to keep this short, these Zoomcasts shorter now. Um, in that uh, there was one case that I that's always stuck in my mind and I often talk about it. So some of the viewers may have heard me speak about it before, but it involved a woman who lived on the Gold Coast who rang me some years ago. And uh, she had been on holidays uh, with her daughter in the 1970s at a place called Lorette de Mar in Spain. And when she had been there, she had left her daughter and gone on a walk down to the, um, the coat, down to the um, promenade, down near the water, the waterfront. And um, as she often did, but um, this particular evening, she, as she got closer to that area, she noticed that there was no sound was the very first thing that she noticed so this um then she went kept on walking and as she did she could see um everything in front of her was frozen in time so people speaking had their mouths open people cycling were on the bicycles and they were frozen people even mid-step as they were walking had one foot raised um, and they were frozen in time too all vehicular traffic was frozen absolutely everything no sound um, which was very, very unexpected as anyone who's walked along the coastline at sunset knows that, you know, in a tourist area, it's quite noisy. So um, what happened was she had walked into a sort of shadow, shaded area. And um, as she looked on, she could see um, behind the scene over um, the river, because uh, it was sort of like where the coastline was and then there was an inlet where there was a river that went up there. And there was a bridge across that area, but hovering over the water next to the bridge, she could see a classic spacecraft, you know, circular disc. And she could actually see uh, two beings inside it. She had such a good view and she was not that far away. And um, anyway, what happened was um, she then stepped out of the shadowed area that she was in. And as she did so, uh, underneath the craft, it started to send sparks, and she described it as like a sparkler, um, and uh, and it just came out down in front of the, underneath the craft in front of her, and 
then it took off up the where the water inlet was. And it wasn't until it got some distance up there, up uh, over the inlet and disappeared that ev absolutely everything switched back on again. So she got another fright where she you know, heard all the sound coming very quickly. Um, all the vehicular traffic noise started, people talking, cyclists, you know, all those sorts of things just switched back on as if someone had switched on a, a light switch. Mm -hmm. And she ran over to the nearest person and said, did you see that? Did you see that? Now they said no, they saw nothing. Um, and apparently nobody knew what had occurred, that they had been frozen in time. So this is a good example of a woman, a witness who had seen that zone of, of uh, influence or whatever um, mm -hmm. uh, from the external source, right, mm -hmm. from outside of it. And the people within it apparently appeared to have no knowledge of that experience at all. Who knows what, well, she obviously she wouldn't have talk, spoken to everyone in that area. Um, but it was interesting that that control was maintained by seemingly by the occupants of this spacecraft mm -hmm. until it was out of sight so that nobody would actually see it um, mm -hmm. in the local area. Mm. Yes, um, that's a really good description and it, it's very similar to an experience I had where I was at a barbecue way out in the country and um, in the early 90s and everyone was dancing and cooking sausages and uh, loud music playing and suddenly I saw a massive light just appear out of nowhere over a nearby hill, pointed it out to people and at the moment I pointed it out I noticed that nobody turned around to look at it. People had their backs to it except for me um, and, and the next minute um, exactly the same situation where everybody is dancing and they're they are like frozen statues, the music is pounding. Um, I suddenly lose all memory of what happened next. And the next thing I know is that um, suddenly I'm aware of the loud music again. I, for a split second, I'm looking around at everyone frozen and then everyone starts dancing again as if nothing happened. And my heart was pounding, wondering what was going on and what had happened in that in that time space in between but um you know people who come up close to not just craft and entities but um what you mentioned before about the silence you know we had a group of hunters here in the in the bay of plenty where i live who came to in close proximity to a craft which was initially seen as a large light and they noticed that all the uh more porks and birds in the bush stopped singing there was complete silence and there'd been a light rain and in the area that they were in as if they were under a dome it stopped raining but they could see the rain falling outside of that a particular area that they were in but it wasn't falling on them a big circular area there was no rain and it was completely silent so um, i believe that people are targeted there may be um, situations where uh, you know, something is being transferred to a person, as you said, some information that they can't access until later in their life even, uh, but they know it's there, they know it's arrived in their mind and their consciousness. And so we have these various reasons why these events happen, people being picked up, people being given information, people being examined, etc. cetera. Um, but in terms of the sound that people are often aware of, um, which can sound quite spooky and like, um, paranormal uh, we have to and it seems to be for that targeted person and not those around them and we have already developed some years ago our um, point and shoot technology where um, a, a piece of technology can be pointed at a person in a crowd of thousands and only that person will hear a sound will hear um, sounds in their mind or the head or whatever but no one else around them will so um, are these craft and entities targeting our, our own energy signature? Are they targeting an implant that some people have? Are some people just random participants in something where the craft wants to do something in the area, but they don't want everyone to see it happening? There's a lot of unanswered questions, and, and I think that um, re-interviewing people who've experienced this, particularly back in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, would be a great exercise to look at it in light of the information that we now have scientifically. 
and in many other fields of, of science um, along with physics. Mm. If only we had another life. Yeah. yeah. Get a few clones. <laughs> Not enough time. <laughs> There's only so much time to do something, to do exactly. things. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Yes, but I was just going to, just before we, we wind up, I was just going to briefly mention um, <clears throat> a case that happened here uh, in my home a few months ago where I had a group here that was meeting and there are about 20 people here. We, um, I also run an after, a monthly afterlife discussion group, as you know. And um, at that particular uh, group meeting, um, two people, one of them uh, was Barry Taylor, who was here, my colleague, and mm -hmm. another lady. And um, the two of them reported that they had a moment where everything went quiet. There was no sound, no noise, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. None of us saw it. None of us uh, mm -hmm. uh, experienced it. Um, Barry asked a few different people uh, about that. Um, you know, had they noticed anything unusual? No. And I have to say, if it was just him who'd said that to me, I might have fobbed it off. But because mm. there was a corroborating witness mm. to his experience, the two of them experienced it at the same time while they were having mm. a chat. Where everything that's very went, interesting. Yes, where yeah, everything that, went silent. Yeah. That's very interesting. And just briefly, back in the late 70s, I was travelling up a remote road late at night with my um, former husband. And um, we saw a, a, the whole, a whole valley lit up like daylight so that you could see the trees. Um, everything was like daylight. And then we experienced the Oz factor with the extremities of the body going numb, feeling slightly dizzy, um, sounds receding, the car stopped. Um, and um, I later found out through doing a regression that I, that, um, I was taken on board the craft. But the interesting thing is that um, I put a write-up of this on my website and um, some years later I was approached by an elderly Maori lady who lived in the area and she and her husband had been on the other side of the valley. They had also seen the valley light up and they had also experienced the same um, Oz factor feelings associated with that um, encounter. But um, I don't recall them being there at all or one of them being taken along with me. I have no recollection of that. But she described those same symptoms, which is very interesting. So we were on opposite sides of, of this long valley. So it's very good to have that corroborative evidence that um, Barry and the other lady had at that meeting mm. that something is happening and something that we don't yet understand adequately. Yes, there's certainly more to, to investigate around this. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, even on a day-to-day day -day basis, there could be things going on in our own lives that we're mm -hmm. not even aware of. If, uh, mm -hmm. if an advanced civilization um, has this technology, if it is technological, um, to create these situations, then goodness knows what's going on to the human race that we have no clue about. Mm -hmm. Mm. That's right. So there's the Oz factor. That is. <laughs> so anything in closing, Susie? Um, no, not really. Just that, um, you know, we, we have a massive data on this worldwide. It's a fascinating aspect of the contact phenomenon. And it's very common in close encounters with craft and entities. Mm. Okay. There you have it, folks. So um, thanks for joining us and we'll be back soon with a, another topic for a Strange Encounters Zoomcast. And Merry Christmas, everyone. Yes, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thanks, Cheryl.